we are extremely proud to host at the Goa Art and Literary Festival. This is a book released for the first time in the subcontinent, but it's a book of extreme importance to the subcontinent. It's Coolie Woman by Gaitra Bahadur, who is a veteran journalist. Um, I'll read out a bit of the bio here. Gaitra Bahadur is a journalist and book critic who writes frequently about the culture and politics of global migration. Her reporting, criticism, and essays have appeared in the New York Times Book Review, Washington Post, Book World, The Nation, The Observer, and Ms. among other publications. A former daily newspaper reporter, Gaitra studied literature at Yale and journalism at Columbia and was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard. She was born in Guyana and emigrated to the United States as a child. Everything that Gaitra is going to tell us about here is a retrieved and extremely important history and we are extremely proud as a festival which celebrates and talks about ways of belonging that we are releasing the book at the Goa Arts and Literary Festival. Please, Gaitra, join me. Um, I, I'm actually exceptionally, um, I feel exceptionally privileged to be here on stage with Gaitra because for a number of reasons, but also I studied indenture. It's an episode in India's history as well as global economic history of great importance because it created a diaspora of millions of people who have di different ways of belonging to India and of course have had tremendous importance in the countries that they moved to. Many countries in the world became majority Indian descent due to this process. It's a phenomenon that's totally equivalent to the Atlantic slave trade. But I think that because many people here will not have, uh, will not be super familiar with it, maybe begin with a series of readings from your book, Gaitra. Thanks, Vivek. It's great to be here to launch the book in the subcontinent. I feel like I've come full circle because there are a few folks in this room who were there at the beginning in 2008 when I, I first started doing research and um, became interested in writing a book about my great-grandmother. Um, so the book traces her journey. Her name was Sujaria. She was 27, uh, four months pregnant and by herself when she left India. Uh, the book traces her journey to the West Indies, but in the process it also picks open uh, this broader public history of, of women who uh, migrated as indentured servants, most of whom were just like her, they were sing, quote unquote single women traveling unaccompanied by husbands. So I'm going to read uh, from a chapter called Into Dark Waters, which is set in Garden Reach. And this is a neighborhood in Calcutta uh, where the indentured immigrants waited for ships to take them to new worlds. And it's where my great grandmother, Sujaria, waited for her ship. I tried to imagine my great-grandmother in this setting, preparing to board the Clyde in 1903. How did she ever get to this point of departure, surrounded by so many fragmented families and outcasts, bearing secrets and unstated loss? Did she look back over her shoulder as she boarded the ship? Was there regret in her glance? I don't know, because she didn't say. But I do know the story of one woman who had no regrets when she left Garden Reach in 1916. Maharani could not remember her parents' names by the time she told her story in a voice frail with age. She was a child when they died. They weren't there for her wedding to a much older man whose name she couldn't remember either. Maharani was five when she got married and she was still just a child, only 12 when widowed. Soon after, her brother-in-law took her to a magistrate's office where, too young to know any better, she ceded the rights to her inheritance from her husband. For eight years after his death, she cooked and cleaned for her in-laws, bearing their beatings for minor mishaps, much like the one that ultimately triggered her journey to Trinidad. She left, literally, over spilled milk. Maharani had just boiled milk for her in-laws when a cat crept up to lick the pot. She pelted the cat, the cat fell over, and the pot capsized. Anticipating another thrashing and suddenly unwilling to accept one, she slipped out while her in-laws were eating. In 1987, Maharani explained why she fled. 
I said I'm gonna beat me because I get him too much licks. I said I'm gonna beat me. Well, I run. I didn't tell nobody I'm leaving. On the road later that night, she met a man with one foot at a well. When he heard her predicament, he offered to help. Did she want a job on an island where she could make 25 cents a day? All she would have to do, he claimed, is sift sugar. Did she want to go? Maharani said yes, she did want to go. She would go. Mina had nothing, she said, recalling how at 20 she calculated the costs and benefits of leaving India. I come wait, Mina have nothing. As her boat, the Chenab, was anchored in the Hooghly River, another ship pulled in, bringing home Indians who had finished their indentures. They clambered to portholes to warn the emigrants staring back out of their own portholes. From a distance, the repatriates shook their hands, gesturing for the emigrants not to go. But it was too late for anyone to heed that message. This was the point when the umbilical cord connecting the immigrants to India was presumably cut. Several survivors of indenture, in the rare accounts that describe the severing, mention weeping. They conjure a scene of breast beating and wailing as the ship embarked. But Maharani did not cry, nor did she remember sounds of sorrow. She remembered drum beats. Looking back across the span of seven decades, she described how her jihajis played drums provided by the crew and how they sang and danced during the journey. Then bringing happy, then me bringing no trouble, then bringing happy. Nobody to study nothing. That's why them bringing happy. There was nobody to make her study a single thing. Nobody to cause her grief or worry. No brother-in-law to cheat her, no mother-in-law to beat her. Nobody, she thought, to make her tremble in fear any longer. But should Maharani have been so convinced that no one would cause her grief anymore? The warning by the repatriates as her ship got ready to leave the Hooghly was ominous. Might they have been warning about the voyage itself to begin with? Indenture vessels were, after all, crossing in the wake of slavers with their well-documented horrors from tragic mortality rates to the rape of women. Second passage is um, set on the seas um, from India to, during the voyages from India to the West Indies, and it's based on research that I did on 77 indenture voyages. Whenever a ship docked, the chief immigration agent at its destination had to report on its passage from India. Some of these dispatches, including the one detailing my great-grandmother's voyage, have been destroyed. But those that survive pull back the screen, if only for brief moments and partial views on the lives of the women aboard. It is hard in these glimpses to escape the angle of sex sexual exploitation by figures of all ranks and races. In these archives of misconduct, the women appear resisting advances, or giving in to them, or, in the eyes of many ship officials, courting them. But the records also provide other views of the women, on deathbeds, giving birth, losing children, going mad, being driven to suicide, engaged in infanticide, rejecting or being rejected by shipboard husbands, demanding that husbands prove themselves, stowing away, crying, cursing, possibly in love, and clearly in anguish. I cannot imagine that the journey was anything but a saga, even for emigrants whose lives passed relatively without incident. Seasickness afflicted most. A majority fell ill with mumps, measles, dysentery, hookworm, or fever. The ache for home was so sharp that one ship surgeon declared, I know that many die from nostalgia, pure and simple. The excitement of the newness of everything keeps them up for a time, but soon dies away, and is followed by depression when they realize what they have done. The realization must have dawned slowly, as the sea lengthened, and the conditions aboard affected them one by one. As blankets rough as jute, sometimes rotten and foul-smelling, cause pus to form on children as the fans for circulating air were shut down at night when most needed, 
as the condenser to make the water potable broke, which it routinely did, and as the floor beneath them sweated. All the while, surgeons prepared their balance sheets of births and deaths, recording Shiva's unending dance without realizing it. The Hindu god who destroys in order to create, who dances in a ring of flames to maintain the universe's ceaseless cycle of creation and destruction, did not forget the cargo hold. I'm referring to something far more metaphysical than mortality or birth rates. Here a woman born on a ship to the West Indies in 1888. On that mad ocean, when all was tossing, people's heads were spinning, and then labor pains started for Ma to have her child. On that mad ocean, I was born. On that mad ocean, I came to life. She was describing her own origins, but with her incantatory words, she could have been telling the creation story of our people, mine and hers. She could have continued in her voice of myth. In our beginning, there was a boat. On that mad ocean, we came to life. We passed the Red Sea to reach the black. The water was blue before it was green, and then it was mud. We crossed seven seas, seven shades of water, shades of darkness and light, light that died and darkness that was born, darkness somehow extinguished and light rekindled. The captain's wheel became Shiva's fiery circle, turning and turning in its cosmic spiral. And in the gyrating of the gale, the gales and the churning of the waves, as one steered and the other danced, we became new. The moorings of caste had loosened, and people who had left behind uncles, sisters, husbands, and mothers substituted shipmates, their jihajis, for kin. Unraveled, they began, ever so slowly, to spin the threads of a novel identity. Indentureships were not slave ships, but there can be no denying a few ties that should have bound the three million Africans trafficked by the British as slaves and the million Indians transported as coolies. The people in the hold in both cases were cut from the same demographic, mainly young and overwhelmingly male. Women were in short supply and subject to sexual exploitation during both crossings. And both journeys were transformative, signaling a break with the past, making whatever came before it seem almost as un unimaginable to later generations as time and space before the Big Bang. In the beginning, there was a boat. Having emerged from its belly as survivors, the indentured Indians could no longer be who they had been. Like the slaves before them, they were an entirely new people, forged by suffering, created through destruction. In this sense, above all else, theirs was a middle passage marked by brutal reinvention. How do I even begin to situate my great-grandmother in this odyssey? If I draw an imaginary line from moment to moment on the ships, from glimpse to glimpse of women aboard, will her shape emerge constellation-like? Could the wrong shape emerge if I connect the wrong moments to each other? How do I know which are right? Will her constellation give off light? That's it. Thank you. Director, as you know, I've read and really, really uh, been impressed and enjoyed your book. But hearing you read it, um, I can see the word that was popping into my head. I can see, in a way, why you call it the Odyssey of indenture. It, it's epic. Um, the story you tell is told in an epic manner, and it's an amazing act of retrieving a history which nobody knew about. As I told you, I studied it, uh, indenture. I have no idea about the kinds of things you've talked about. Um, I'm very, very, um, I'm so, it, again, I must tell you, it's a tremendous privilege to have you here. Um, I'd like to ask you, how do you, how do you uh, I, I know you were a journalist and you wrote about migration and, and issues which have to deal with uh, belonging um, in the US. What was the main challenge in doing this extraordinary act of retrieval, retrieving issues? Well, this, the book focuses on the lives of, of women, um, indentured women. The problem was that I didn't actually have any of their stories in their own words. Um, there are only two indentured memoirs that exist. One came out of Fiji, one out of Suriname, and, and both were written by men. 
Um, so, I mean, here I had uh, a central subject and n n no testimony coming from directly from them. Uh, so the challenge was how, how, to, how to, first of all, recover that history, um, and then how to narrate it, how to tell it. Um, so, you know, it struck me that um, I, could use, I could use questions. Um, I was listening to a New, New Yorker fiction podcast, actually, and, and heard a short story by the American writer Donald Barthelm <laughs> concerning the bodyguard. And it was, it was like a revelation. This is a short story that's written um, from the perspective of a, a bodyguard who's um, protecting uh, the, a leader in an unnamed Latin American country. And it's written almost entirely in questions. There might be two statements in the entire text. And it's supposed to mirror, of course, this man's anxiety. This is how he apprehends the world. When he looks at a woman walking down the street carrying a bag, he questions the bag. What's in that bag? What, <laughs> you know, what could happen to me next? Um, so I thought maybe I could apply this method uh, in the book and use questions. And there are actually long sections of the text that are just questions. Hopefully. Um, questions that, that operate on many levels, that, that flesh out the detail of landscapes and advance the, advance the plot and even have attitude, you know, my attitude toward the archives because there's no way I can possibly be neutral towards them as someone who is a product of this history. So at times the questions are cheeky, um, at times they are a little more reflective and contemplative. Um, I use photographs as well. To, uh, I found incredible archival images and described them throughout the text. Um, I use the Ramayan because it's a story, I mean we talk about how there, there are very few texts to work with in recovering the history of indenture, but there is actually this, this, this central fundamental text that uh, was pre preserved on the plantations um, as oral tradition. You know, um, and it deals with some of the, the very themes that the book does, you know, themes of, of exile, of um, women's honor, and women's honor violated, of, of return, uh, to, uh, return to Ayodhya, I, I use um, as a um, return to India, uh, which about a quarter of indentured immigrants did ultimately return. Um, most interestingly, I think, I, the, the figure of Shopanika in the Ramayan, um, she is mutilated by Lakshman, and um, in the history of indenture, there is a really dark and dark passage, dark episode in our history in which women were murdered by their partners using the uh, cutlass or the machete, which is the, the tool they used in the cane fields. Um, and it was framed as a story of, of um, jealousy and punishment, but it was actually far deeper than that, um, springing from the shortage of women on the plantations. So I use the figure of Shopanika being mutilated um, as, as kind of an allegory for what happened to the women on the plantations. So those are some, of, I had to seek alternate methods basically to tell the story. Right, and you've done so wonderfully. I, I want, one thing I would like you to understand, I may be giving the wrong impression, even from the extracts that Gaitra has uh, given, that this is a story of loss, a painful story. Uh, it's not actually. It's, there's a tremendous triumph in the book. It's, uh, there are bits of it which are tri triumphal. I think one of the things we talked about actually Mr. Hazarika brought up is that in leaving, you find yourself, right? And that is a, that is a theme in the book. Um, there, there are many, many stories here which are powerful stories of, um, of uh, self kind of uh, what should I say, self-confidence, which is found once you escape India. Do you feel that that is also a kind of theme in, uh, in, in the story of indenture? Yes, there are, two, there are two competing narratives about indenture. The first is that it was a new form of slavery. Um, and so you hear stories of kidnap from the descendants of indentured immigrants. Um, and my great-grandmother actually told a story of kidnap. But the, sec the second narrative is, is one of liberation, of escape. And this applied especially to women, because they were sort of the most desperate women who were targeted to go. Um, widows in many cases, um, prostitutes in some cases, women who had been forced to leave their husbands for various reasons. 
either because they were they were fleeing domestic abuse or um, their husbands had been unfaithful or accused them of being unfaithful. Uh, so for them, leaving India was an opportunity to reinvent and recreate themselves. But, uh, the story that I heard um, about my great grandmother uh, came from one of her granddaughters, who was eight at the time that she heard it. And um, Sujaria, my great grand grandmother, was apparently sitting in the pipe and chatting with um, women who had been on the same ship as she had been when she said. Um, she told the story of her exit from India, that she was on a pilgrimage uh, when white men in boats came along and promised to take her to the next stop on her holy tour, and she said yes, and then ultimately ended up uh, in Calcutta at the depot on her way to, to British Guyana to work on the plantations. Um, so there, I mean, there is this tension throughout in the stories that have come down between um, enslavement and liberation. And, I, I mean, I, I don't think I've written a, a polemical book at all. I've written a book that is very interested in questions in the speculative mode. And I think the answer to that problem of enslavement versus um, liberation uh, is as different as, or as multiple as there are immigrants, as multiple as there are women. It was different for each of them. And in each case, the answer was different. Tremendous politics also built into this question. I want to tell you, as we've just seen demonstrated, uh, Keju Cole, who is a good friend of the festival and has returned again and again, has described uh, the narrative as both scholarly and soulful. And I think that we've absolutely seen the exhibition of that here, in a way, because your story is tremendously soulful. It's in the tradition, actually, of, uh, of Calypso, and I think. You know, it's a, it is a, it is a, it is a, it's a means of telling a story which is, which is musical, which is historical, which is uh, uh, obviously non-fiction, but there's also a kind of, uh, what do I say, uh, uh, an interesting narrative built around it. I'd like to take questions now because we are running slightly late. Uh, two writers who have wrote, written extensively on, on migration, one is of course Amitabh Ghosh and it's, series and the other is Hugh Tinker with the New Slave Trade. I mean, that's not a huge book, but it's a very significant book. Uh, did any of this influence you in any way? Uh, yeah, Hugh Tinker's book, A New, New System of Slavery, is a foundational text in indenture studies. Um, but again, his approach is from the outside rather than from the inside. Um, which is, I mean, it's not a criticism of him, it's, it's just his position in relation to the story. Um, and Amitabh Ghosh's work, of course, I appreciate very much. Um, and there are others who have written about this subject, and in particular about the place of women in indenture. Um, what is different about this book? I mean, there have been fictional attempts to deal with the subject, and then there have been straight non-fictional accounts. What this book does differently is it sort of occupies a middle terrain. It, it is creative nonfiction or narrative nonfiction. Um, it, the for me the most powerful thing was to 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 retrieve the stories and then tell them fully. I think what a lot of academics tend to do is they compress the material. Um, this is the, this is what they have to do to to form to to form an analysis. But what I've done is sort of uh, think of it as an accordion, you stretch it out and let the stories breathe. Um, I mean, I, I have a question. I, I did my own uh, research into to a, to a, a moment sort of in Goan history that I was interested in, which was the Goan Inquisition. And there are so many competing voices on what happened. And, you know, there are documents, but it's, you know, it, it leads it to. And how did you wait through that? I mean, obviously, you were connected to the material. And uh, you know, it, it is a it is in that borderland between nonfiction and and fiction. And uh, I think the importance here is like writers shape they shape memory more than I think people realize. Um, I think Toni Morrison's works have colored our memory of slavery. Faulkner's colored our memory of the South. And did you feel that sort of responsibility? And how did you how did you make your choices? Um. <clears throat> Well, I mean, there were competing narratives sometimes in even um, one family's story. 
so a granddaughter would remember what happened a particular way and a great granddaughter would remember it an entirely different way um, and again I mean not not writing a polemical book not writing a didactic book I, I pr presented both versions and, and sort of one of the themes is um, you know that the stories that families tell about themselves are almost as important as what actually happened um, and I think Derek Walcott said something like, a history is fiction subject to a fitful muse memory and everything depends on whose memory the story is being filtered through, the hero or the victim. So, I mean, I did feel a sense of responsibility to, to tell the story as a descendant of people who have been perhaps victimized. Matra, um, really again, it's uh, been a privilege to have you. I hope you enjoyed the festival. And please go check out her book. It's, uh, Absolutely marvelous, unique uh, book of uh, as as I said, it's both scholarly and soulful. Thank you so much. Guys.